All right, good afternoon uh, and welcome to the HNRCA Monday seminar series. We are excited to have you join our research community in nutrition and healthy aging for the presentation today. Uh, this is the first lecture of our series for the fall semester. Our complete list of fall 2022 speakers is posted on the HNRCA website. Uh, this year, we have expanded both our audience and invited speakers globally, so welcome to everyone. And if this is the first time you're attending, welcome. We're glad to have you here. The format for today will be a speaker presentation followed by a moderated Q&A session. Uh, and you are welcome to submit questions anytime during the talk in the Q&A box. The topic of today's presentation is related to understanding Alzheimer's disease and dementia, which has immense importance in current research. And at the HNRCA especially, we have a large and growing research interest in brain health and disease prevention. Our speaker today is Dr. A. Ling Lin, Professor and Vice Chair for Research in Radiology and Professor in the Biological Sciences and Institute of Data Science and Informatics at the University of Missouri. Dr. Lin does research on the gut-brain access in Alzheimer's and translational neuroimaging, as well as research on topics including brain injury, cognitive function, MRI markers, APOE4, nutrition, and prebiotics. Uh, so thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. I'd like to now welcome Dr. Aileen Lin. Thank you so much, Catherine, uh, for the nice introduction and thank you for the invitation. It's a great honor to me uh, to be here to be able to present our work. Um, so my overall research goal is to develop precision health approaches to slow down brain aging and mitigate risk for Alzheimer's disease and related dementia. And we have been using pharmacological and nutritional interventions um, and apply a wider range of uh, uh, tool set uh, because I'm a neuroimager, so I definitely include neuroimaging and now looking to gut brain access. So I also include gut microbiome sequencing, multiomics um, analysis, including metabolomics, transcriptomics, and finally uh, AI, artificial intelligence, to identify the pattern. So uh, today I'm going to uh, briefly touch on Alzheimer's disease uh, history and failure of clinical trials and how we apply AI to identify imaging markers and modifiable risk factors for AD mitigation. Uh, then I will give you example from one of uh, them is from, from uh, pharmacology is an anti-aging drug called rapamycin uh, is an mTOR inhibitor. Then I will show how we're using multi-model MRI to see the brain changes with this uh, drug. And I will have one slide showing ketogenic diet as well because it's also a mTOR inhibitor. And then the second example will be a diet, prebiotic diet, and how we use this diet to modulate gut microbiome and potentially protect the brain and systematic metabolism. And we are using a APOE, uh, humanized APOE mouse model. And because different APOE genotype will respond to the drug and diet differently. So I will also touch on how pharmacogenetic and nutrigenetic effects can impact in our research. And then I will touch on how we can translate these animal findings into clinical trials and can, how can we uh, uh, develop AI-based precision health approach in the future, and then summary. So just uh, give you an alarming statist uh, statistics about Alzheimer's disease. Uh, AD is the most common form of dementia. Currently, there are uh, more than 6 million Americans living with the disease, and the number is projected to rise to nearly 30 million uh, by 2050. One in three seniors die with AD, and in the United States uh, during the pandemic, the death, death rate increased 16%. And this AD kills more than breast and prostate cancer combined. Currently, the economic uh, cost is three. 55 billion, and the number is expected to become 1.1 trillion by 2050. And more than 11 million Americans provide unpaid care for people with AD. So you can see that this is a devastating uh, disease, not only for the individual, but also for the family and the society as a whole. And then, uh, unfortunately, there is currently no effective treatment once the symptom, uh, clinical symptom develops. develops. And today is 2022, but actually the disease already 
been known or identified in early 19th, it's more than a century, we already know this disease. This first one is identified by Dr. Alois Alzheimer. So this disease is after named after him. And what he found is one of his patient, uh, called Auguste, she had very bizarre behavior when she was still alive. She experienced memory loss, paranoia, and psychological changes. And so he has been very curious about this patient. So after her death, Dr. Alzheimer's did an autopsy on her and found that she has a shrinkage in and around nerve cell in her brain. And also there are some tangles and plaques around his brain tissue. And so this is the earliest uh, sketches about the brain pathology from this patient. And nowadays we know this is called amyloid beta plaques and tau. A beta is outside the neuron and tau is the uh, um, a filament that stabilizes the neuron structure. But when it's first phosphorylated, it becomes this destabilized and so the uh, neurons start to shrink down. So compared to the uh, health cells, you can see there's a really destruction in the communication between neurons and other cells. And there's another component called neurodegeneration. So you can see there's a brain shrinkage uh, in the patient compared to the healthy controls. And now scientists uh, kind of uh, frame this as ATM framework, A is A beta, T is tau, and N is neurodegeneration. Before the imaging, we need to wait till uh, uh, people to um, do autopsy to know the uh, changes in ATN. But with the advance of the imaging, now when the patient's still alive, we can start to see all these changes. You can see the uh, shrinkage of the brain and the uh, enlarge of the ventricle and loss of the hippocampus is a major structure for memory and learning. And then um, for uh, glucose uptake, you can see the brain because the brain tissue is being lost. So the glucose uptake also being uh, really low and also scares uh, through the PET imaging. And another one using imaging is that we can start to see the uh, plaques. So this is a beta plaques in the uh, uh, patients and com compared to the control. But unfortunately, even though we know the pathology, we all know the progress of this symptoms, but there is no effective treatment. So 99.6% uh, of failure rate for clinical trial between 2002 to 2012, and more failure in more recently in 2019. And until last year, so between 2012 till 2021, there's only one drug being approved by FDA, which is Adalhem. But un unfortunately, this drug is very um, controversial and also terminated in June 2022. And why is that? Um, because all this drug is uh, developed based on this amyloid hypothesis, uh, suggesting that once you remove the plaques, then the, the brain will be restored and the memory will be restored and the functionality will be restored for the patient. But unfortunately, it's not the case. And why is that? Um, that's because A-beta actually have a lot of false positive rate. Uh, many now using imaging, we know that many um, healthy, cognitively normal person, they never develop dementia. They also have A beta plaque surrounding in their brain like this. So, so is A beta is a real, the right target for therapeutics? Now there's a huge debate uh, in the field. So, um, so since 1906, we know this disease, but now we still don't have yet have a solution. So where should we go from now and what can we do? So actually I am kind of unconventional <laughs> person in this field. So this is my view of uh, Alzheimer's disease. You can disagree with me, that's totally fine. This is just my view and then see where we can go from here. So I see this disease is more like an iceberg, a huge iceberg. And, but if we only consider um, A beta, maybe just a tip of this iceberg. So if we only target on that, they definitely bring us to a high uh, failure for a uh, clinical trial. Now people start to look into tau. Maybe it can give us a little bit idea how this disease has been um, impacted our memory and um, um, functionality. But there's a lot beneath the water has been underappreciated. And that's why I'm seeing that it's related to neurodegeneration. And this part can be occur four, three, four decades before the clinical symptom 
uh, become obvious. Those are metabolic deficit, neurovascular deficit, uh, microbiome dysbiosis, neuroinflammation, oxidative stress, mitochondria dysfunction, et cetera. And this idea is not just from me, actually is very consistent with current idea thinking that Alzheimer's disease may be a type three diabetes, uh, which means that there's an insulin resistance in the brain. And this can develop um, over decades uh, before the a person start to show memory loss or uh, severe dementia. So that's why the field has more uh, shift focus on, maybe we need to focus on lifestyle, um, diet or exercise or even microbiome or anything that related to metabolism or vascular function. Then it help us uh, mitigate the risk of Alzheimer's disease. So, but this is uncertain at this point. It's like ATN, we have ATN, but which one makes the more um, contribution or importance for this disease progression? So to uh, uh, address this, we divide, uh, develop an AI project uh, using machine learning and look into the database from Alzheimer's disease um, related database to ask two questions. Are ATM markers equally important throughout AD uh, development stages? Or can we using uh, artificial intelligence identify potential therapeutics alternative to A beta? So this is a, um, a population we're using from the Alzheimer's disease neuro, uh, neuroimaging initiative database is pub publicly uh, available. You can go inside and take out those data. So we have three groups of people uh, cognitively unimpaired late MCI mark, mild cognitive impairment. These are still considering early stage of dementia. And Alzheimer's disease is really late stage. It's a very severe form of dementia. So we have these three groups. And we want to compare how ATN uh, progress in these uh, three groups. So we do a, a random forest um, um, study design using five-fold validation. And we take 16 features from that database. And you can see all this, including ATN, the FDG is a glucose uptake, MRI is a brain structure. So this relate to N and A beta is A, and then uh, tau is from CSF because they don't have imaging marker yet. So we have ATN and throw it into this model. And then uh, this is what we found. Um, even though there are 16 features, but uh, we found that the top A features contribute most uh, to determine the importance uh, of the disease progression. Um, and the result is very, just using top A is very similar to using the whole 16 features, which means that the rest, the bottom A features may be redundant. They are not really contributing to the importance in the model. But using this top A or top 16 features, we have high accuracy to classify each group. So be between the uh, CU, um, so the accuracy is from 70 to 91%, depend depending on the, the, the stages. And then, um, who are, and so when we look deeper, what are those eight features? You can see that in the early stage between cognitive and normal and early uh, dementia or late MCI, a beta and tau, they indeed play an important role. Uh, they are necessary to be there to cause mild cognitive impairment. The, the importance, relative importance is like 32% important. But when the disease becomes severe, you can see their importance has goes down um, around 10 to 15 percent ish. In contrast, is the uh, FDG glucose uptake, which is neurodegeneration component, become more and more important. So that tells us an uh, uh, idea is like A beta and tau are important, but they're necessary, but not sufficient to cause from uh, mild cognitive impairment into late uh, severe form. So maybe we need to also focus on a lot more. Right now, the field is really focused on A and T, but my research program is started thinking about whether we also need to include N as a part of this uh, figure. So this study is using imaging marker, but not everyone uh, nowadays in clinic is not so convenient to get imaging. So how about just using medical record? So can we just use look into medical history and then identify the markers that separate a person from cognitively normal into uh, dementia. So now we turn to the National Alzheimer's Disease, um, Alzheimer's Coordinator Center uh, database. It's also publicly available. And now we're looking to conversion. Uh, what make a person converted 
um, in six years from normal into AD? What are those factors? So, and then, um, and then we do uh, another uh, random, uh, another machine learning studies. And this is a huge list, uh, it's kind of busy. So I give you a, a snapshot here. So th those are the top factors, age, right? We know age definitely uh, driving down. Uh, increase the risk for Alzheimer's. And education, low education have high risk. Cardiovascular diseases, you can see from the list, like um, resting heart rate or blood pressure, all these are related to cardiovascular disease and depression, smoking. This is jump up all the time. And also APOE status. So you can see that from the list, many of them are mo modifiable risk factors, right? So if we focus on their lifestyle, their diet, maybe we can modulate some of those. But age and APOE status is kind of non-modifiable risk factors. So that's why we, we think about a way to slow down aging um, that can may so, uh, also uh, mitigate the risk for dementia. And so if the, we, we put this into a model and calculate the pro probability score, you can see that if a person have all this in their list, their probability become Alzheimer's is much higher compared to those who don't have those uh, factors. So how about APOE status? Um, if this is a non-modifiable factor. Can we do something about it and to help those who have this genotype uh, to have uh, lower their risk? So. We know APOE4 carriers is, uh, APOE4 is the most highest genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's. That, and um, that's the reason why um, this is gene is reside on chromosome 19. And you can see that um, it, there's a different um, amino acid in this uh, synapse and cause the uh, structure difference between E2, E3, and E4. E2 is uh, protective against Alzheimer's and E3 is more neutral and E4 is highest genetic risk factor. And because of the, the structural difference, you can see the shape of this protein uh, is very different from the other two. And because of the shape, so it's easier to bind with a very low density lipid protein, VLDL. And this protein is easier, high affinity to lump with A beta. So that's why they have higher risk to get a big lump of uh, plaques. So if an individual uh, uh, possess one or two copies of uh, this APOE4 alleles, they have four to eight for increased risk for developing Alzheimer's. And the age of uh, onset is 17 to uh, 15 years uh, earlier compared to the non-carriers. So how can we do about this? Can we uh, give a pharmacological or nutritional intervention to um, prevent that? Um, so give you a little bit more background about APOE4, um, about neurodegeneration. Actually, neurodegeneration occur much earlier in this population. Um, you can see in the young, uh, young adults, 20 to 39 year old, when they are still free from A beta and tau uh, tangles in their brain, they start to show hypo metabolism, glucose uptake in their brain. So this is a PET scan. And you can see the, um, I don't know whether you can see my mouse, um, um, the, the blue dots showing the, the brain region um, uh, having hypometabolism in this young adult. And the purple region is the brain region in Alzheimer's disease patient. So you can see that there's already an overlap of hypometabolism um, in the APOE4 carriers. And you can see that the, the, um, the, uh, the area become larger when uh, the age become older and eventually potentially full, uh, full grown into this uh, big chunk of uh, brain region of hypometabolism. Not only glucose uptake changes, uh, we know um, cerebral blood flow deliver all this nutrient, glucose, oxygen in the brain. So when there is a lower glucose uptake, potentially, supposedly, presumably, the uh, supply also got uh, disrupted. And that's what they saw um, in MRI scan as well. There's a reduced cerebral blood flow in young adults uh, from you know, 18 to 30 year old, they're still considerably normal and young, but their uh, brain already start to change. And then do a functional um, MRI. So there's a memory task and compare E3 and E4 carriers. And you can see that E4 carriers will need you to recruit more brain region to do the perform the same task, suggesting that the brain may need to work harder to get the same result uh, because the deficit of metabolic and vascular uh, function. 
So how can we do about that? So I think about, because I was studying brain aging, so I'm thinking about if we're using some anti-aging agent, can we be able to slow down aging and in the meantime, mitigate the risk for um, Alzheimer's disease? So the first one I'm looking into is this mammalian target of rapamycin path, uh, signaling. Uh, mTOR is a nutrient sensor, even though it's a, we are using drug in this study, but actually we are targeting a nutrient sensor. And this mTOR pathway is like when the food is uh, abundant um, and the, the signal will activate, it will activate mTOR and will tell the system that you need to grow, you need to produce, uh, do protein synthesis, you have to, uh, do a lot of growth. So there's a, a, a it's like a growing <laughs> signaling. But when there is a scarce, scarcity of food or nutrient, then this uh, pathway will be inhibited. So the in inhibition of mTOR is telling the system, now we don't have the uh, abundance of a nutrient, so stop growing. Let's do some maintenance, like housekeeping, or DNA repair, or doing autophagy to clean up those misfolded protein. So, and more and more studies showing that inhibition of mTOR actually can slow down aging, extend longevity, and promote health span in various animal models. And the mTOR receptor is very abundant in the brain. So brain will really uh, respond to this mTOR signaling. And in a recent um, review paper, we show that there are several ways we can uh, inhibit mTOR, uh, rapamycin or cloud restriction or ketogenic diet. All this can show part of and inhibition, uh, inhibition of mTOR. And in this review paper, we show more on how that relate to brain function. Using imaging and other technology, we've, we already show that uh, inhibition and mTOR can maintain vascular function and metabolic function. So today I'm just give you a few um, examples of how we using um, primarily using rapamycin. And I will have a slide showing ketogenic diet because I think uh, diet and uh, nutrition will be uh, interest of uh, this audience. So, so in, uh, rapamycin actually is FDA approved uh, for many, many years and has been using in cancer and organ transplantation. But recently people show that if you're using lower dose compared to those uh, cancer and organ transplantation therapeutic range, they actually extend longevity in many animal models and also imp improve immune functions in elderly humans. So people start to think about repurpose of this drug. Can we apply this FDA approved drug into other disease domains such as Alzheimer's disease or brain aging? And my colleagues in San Antonio actually already start to show that using rapamycin, they can reduce AD pathology and restore memory in mouse models. So you can see on this slide, the control uh, and the C panel is a huge bloom up of A beta plaques. And with rapamycin, it's almost clear out uh, the plaques. And the G and H panels are the tau tangles. So again, the, the drug also can uh, reduce the tau tangles. And how about vascular function? So when I was in San Antonio, uh, I using imaging MRI to measure cerebral blood flow, vascular density, and the cerebral uh, amyloid angiopathy. So again, we see that rapamycin restore vascular function, even though the mice already develop cognitive impairment. Um, and then they restore their vasculature. I don't know whether you can see there, but the vascular density become higher. And the CAA uh, here, you can see the green is the uh, blood vessel and the red uh, the spot are the amyloid. So once we clear, uh, given the rapamycin, the amyloid beta uh, surrounding the blood vessel has been majority uh, clear up. So we look into potential mechanism as like um, this potentially is the um, me mechanism we're thinking. Uh, mTOR will inhibit ENOS, endothelial nitric oxide activation. But if you inhibit mTOR, then the ENOS become activated. And ENOS can release nitric oxide, NO, which is a um, vascular di dilator. So it, it, it potentially increase cerebral blood flow and then uh, increase the um, Emily beta uh, clearance. But this is just give us a, a, an idea about Alzheimer's disease. It doesn't tell us about APOE genotype. How does this can impacting different genotype and whether there's a pharmacogenetic response? So then we come back with another uh, mouse model that uh, represents human 
APOE3 and E4. And on top of that, they also have a mutation for overexpression of A beta. So this is called EFED mouse model. And we can reconstruct the timeline of the development. And it's very similar to humans. You can see that uh, uh, the uh, cerebral blood flow where the neurodegeneration of uh, brain physiology happened first. At two months of age, the mice already have, E4 mice already have dropped down of their cerebral blood flow. And that's before they have A beta showing up in the brain. And that's where uh, also uh, before they start to show cognitive decline. So this is very similar to what we saw previously from human study. So we're thinking about maybe here uh, from two months to four months is the uh, window of opportunity. If we can use the imaging to identify this early change, maybe we can come in early enough, giving either drug or diet to start to prevent them getting worse, eventually fall into the cognitive decline uh, stage. So that's how we designed the study between three to seven months. And then we give a um, MR scan before the scan, uh, before the diet, and I give the diet for four months and do a post MR scan. The good thing about imaging is that you can do longitudinal scan uh, for the same animal. And this is what we found um, that with the four months of the treatment, you can see the E4 mice with uh, rapamycin has uh, kind of restored cerebral blood flow and very comparable to the E3 groups. And there's not much showing difference between the E3, whether given the, diet, uh, the drug or not. And when we do the uh, calculation of a post and pre um, changes of cerebral blood flow, um, we can see that the E4 indeed have an increase in their uh, cerebral blood flow. And to our surprise, this is the majority occur in female. So, so it doesn't really um, impact the male that much. But it's also very encouraging to us because uh, female, E4 female is the most vulnerable vulnerable group, right? We know females has higher incidence uh, risk for getting Alzheimer's compared to male. So I think, uh, so we're thinking about this drug may be most uh, effective in the most vulnerable group. Uh, that's very interesting. And then when we are uh, using uh, MR spectroscopy, uh, we do a voxel imaging uh, on the uh, hippocampus. This is spectra we got uh, from that voxel. And we found uh, three metabolites jumps up. Uh, one is the uh, phosphorus choline um, GPC or PCH. This is cerebral membrane integrity and glutamine. Glutamine is neurotransmitters, NAA and NSTO uh, aspartate is the uh, most abundant in, in neurons. So it's a kind of indicator of neuronal integrity marker. And you can see that during those four months, the control E4 control group have dropped down of all this measurement but the E4 group with rapamycin has protected or preserved a uh, uh, level of all this metabolites and very consistent uh, comparable to the E3 group. And the E3 group, whether with treating with um, rapamycin or not, it doesn't really impacting uh, that much. And then, but this is just a static uh, measurement of metabolites. How about the dynamics of mitochondria function? So we working uh, with Dr. Heider in Yale University. They have this very uh, unique uh, POC uh, technology. And you can track, they label carbon-13 uh, glucose and they infuse in vascular uh, in the vein to the mice. And we do the imaging voxel here. You can see the 75 minutes there, we can see the enrichment of all these peaks. So there's two things we can measure. One is that when they, it goes into the TCA cycle, uh, the oxid, um, it will do phosphorylation oxidation, generate ATP. And then one of the metabolites is called alpha ketoglutarate will exchange with glutamate and glutamate will go into the post neuron, go back to astrocyte, become glutamine and then convert it back to neuron as a glutamate. So this is a neurotransmission cycle called glutamate glutamine cycle. And if, through this um, measurement, uh, this cycle, we can measure two parameters. One is the oxi uh, TCA oxidation rate in neurons and the other one is a neuron transmission rate um, between glutamine and glutamine. So this is the outcome. Uh, we can see that the, uh, even in the young mice, the rapamycin can enhance mitochondria uh, neuron transmission um, uh, cycling as well as the uh, uh, TCA cycle. Most uh, importantly is in the E4 uh, group of mice. 
So this is very encouraging, showing that rapamycin in, uh, enhance both their vasculature and metabolic mitochondria function. And how about A beta and um, the clearance? So we found, uh, working with my former colleague in Kentucky, um, she has a way to uh, measure the uh, 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 transporter uh, on bub and barrier. This transporter can transport A beta from the tissue into the blood and a blood vessel and clear it. And you can see there's a dramatic increase in um, the uh, P PGP level. This, is, this pattern is very similar to the cerebral blood flow. And this is a Western blot. You can see that uh, PGP level increased with uh, rapamycin. So indicating there is an increase in, uh, in clearance of A beta plaques. And we do a standing to validate that. Um, as you can see that the rapamycin um, group for E4 is majority their A beta has been clear out and there's not much um, impact on the E3 mouse model. So it doesn't, E3 mouse model doesn't really uh, respond that much uh, in, in this regard. But how about cognition? Finally, that's what we care about, right? Cognition. So with the drug, even though they are young, potentially still uh, cognitive in, in, uh, intact or normal, but when we do novel object recognition, we still can see that the rapamycin groups spend more time in the new object, which means that they have better uh, spatial memory. And that's both for E3 and E4 group. But when we do an anxiety test uh, using this open arm, so uh, when the mice are less anxious, they will uh, spend more time in this open arm. Um, and when they are more anxious, they will stay in the closed arm. And we only found that E3 mice with rapamycin have they are happier <laughs> in the uh, state in the open home more. So this study very interesting. It's like we found wow, there's potentially a pharmacogenetic response uh, because different genotype respond to the drug very differently. Um, you can see that what I mentioned, majority of the measurement um, is no change in the E3 groups, but others they have very different, like a reduced glycolysis in the E3 group, but uh, reduced long chain fatty acid in the E4 group. So, so the next study will be need to identify mechanism why the uh, different genotype might respond to the drug differently. And this will help us to uh, develop a precision medicine approach, right? This drug may not fit for one, one size fits for all. We need to genotype the participants uh, before we prescribe the drug. Uh, that's the idea. But all these findings are just in animal models. So you, we know that all these drugs, the uh, MOE, uh, AD drugs has been so, so successful in animal models, but when they move into clinical trial, <laughs> Majority of them fail, right? So, so we need to make sure that what we saw in animal can also really applicable to humans. So we start to think about clinical trials and this drug because it's FDA approved, so um, it can uh, help us readily move into clinical trials. And my colleagues in San Antonio, they already are doing therapeutic uh, trial for MCI and AD patient. And for me, I'm more interested in more mitigation or prevention. So we have IRB approved and we're going to recruit participants in this fall uh, in younger group and maybe give a short term of rapamycin. And the most exciting part is that we have higher resolution of MRI uh, for humans and also PET uh, imaging. The 70 MRI can give us a higher resolution, like a subfield of hippocampus. And also you can see all this uh, white matter tracts coming out from hippocampus. And I'm working with my collaborator in Sinai, who is helping me, Dr. Bauchadani is helping us develop this protocol um, so we can do that in Missouri and to get this um, outcome from the participants. So this is a very exciting moment for us to see whether we can really come up with something early enough to mitigate the risk. And then, so this is a drug aspect and how about diet? So we recently published a data uh, with ketogenic diet and showing very similar outcome from rapamycin uh, because it is also targeted on mTOR. So you can see the KD ketogenic diet reduce uh, mTOR um, um, and protein expression. And also they have increased cerebral blood flow in the mice, just young mice, they are still healthy but we still see this effects. And also uh, increase in PGP, the uh, protein, um, a beta clearance. And in the study, we also see that there's a change in gut microbiome. <laughs> so this diet not also impacting the brain, but also impacting the gut microbiome. So this leads us 
to look into when we think, think about brain aging and Alzheimer's disease, the brain is not sitting there in silo. The, uh, the brain is communicating uh, with other organs constant, constantly all the time. And now the most important one people are looking into is the microbiome. Uh, we know the brain and gut communicating in a bi-directional um, direction. And the microbiota did a lot of things for us that the host genome cannot do. For example, uh, producing the neurotransmitters like GABA, serotonin, and short-chain fatty acid, uh, tryptophan metabolism, and also help us to mature our immune system, um, such as our glial cell astrocyte. And you know, because the neurotransmitter really impacting our mood, cognition, and emotion. So it's not surprising that the gut microbiome also will have effects on our um, mental health and cognition. So this is a, a, a healthy picture about how the brain and gut can communicate with each other. But what if there's something wrong uh, in our gut microbiome? And that's been well. Um, now no more from the patient uh, stool sample in an animal model showing that if there's an imbalance of the inflammation, inflammatory microbiota, this called gut dysbiosis, then you can see that there's a reduced in short chain fatty acid, incre increase in this lipopolysaccharides LPS, which is really toxic, can uh, um, trigger many, many inflammation, uh, inflammation response. Um, such as um, nf kappa b IL-6, TNF-alpha, and other uh, inflammatory cytokines. And all of this were also related to A-beta production. So many, many theories say, suggest that, that A-beta may not necessarily just coming from the brain. It can be generating in the gut and then transfer in the brain. And you can see that there's an impairment of barbin barrier, so there's brain leakage and eventually you will cause neurodegeneration and potentially all this uh, neurodegeneration and uh, memory loss. So that's the picture people start to piece together to see how microbiome can impacting our um, cognition. And there's a lot of association um, findings. So our lab is think about, can we have a direct proof showing that this bios is really pr promoting neurodegeneration and A beta and tau? So in this summer, we did a preliminary study. We transfer Alzheimer's disease-related uh, disease patient stool sample into this triple transgenic um, mouse model. And we and we, we wait for one month into MRI scan to measure cerebral blood flow and also do a staining on A-beta and tau. Uh, we are waiting for the data to back, but now we have a CBF data. And you can see that this is a naive note, uh, FMT, and this is from a healthy donor and the AD patient. And um, the color, you can see the AD donors um, stool sample transfer into the mice immediately one month reduce their cerebral blood flow. Uh, I hope you can see the color is cooler in the ADRD donor group. And, um, and in their cortex, right here is cortex, and here is hippocampus. So you can see that the ADRD trans, uh, FMT group has dramatically reduced in cerebral blood flow. So this is a, a first-handed and direct proof showing that dysbiosis have direct impact in our brain physiology. Um, so, so this is not a small thing uh, in terms of uh, gut dysbiosis. So how can we do about that? So our thinking is that if we can modulate the gut microbiome, could potentially can we uh, restore the metabolism for the APOE4 carriers? And um, in this study, we look into prebiotic diets. We didn't use ketogenic diet because ketogenic diet can impact brain and gut at the same time. We don't know which comes first. So we think about a diet, we know it will directly impact gut microbiome first. And then how does that impact in the brain? And we look into prebiotics and prebiotics is a non-digestible component of food. It's a fiber and you can promote and stimulate the growth of uh, beneficial where short-chain fatty acids are producing bacteria. Um, so one of them is inulin. Inulin can be found in the food we are we we're eating daily. And also some of the uh, brand of probiotics also have inulin uh, containing in it. So in this study, uh, my students um, developed this um, diet composition and look into using 
8% fiber. This is the highest amount that uh, can be um, tolerated in a system um, without causing side effects. So we're using 8% inulin and 8% cellulose as a control group. And uh, just feeding them just like the rapamycin study from three months to seven months old. And then um, we found immediately, you can see there's a shift of microbiome diversity in the APOE4 mouse group. And we look into the um, uh, taxa OTU and we found there, there's a couple of so-called good bacteria like uh, Privotella, Lactobacillus has been increased um, in their um, stool sample and also reduce some pro-inflammatory uh, bacteria in those animals. So that's very encouraging. Uh, we know there are some microbiome changes. And how about uh, short-chain fatty acid? So when we uh, take out their cecum and we measure the short-chain fatty acid and all of the three major ones, acetate, probionate, and butyrate also increased um, in the E4 group. Uh, treating with the inulin. And when we take out their brain uh, hippocampus and do transcriptomics, we look into inflammatory cytokine gene expression. There's a 52 um, have impacted, but four of them jumping out. And all of these four are related to either Alzheimer's disease, A-beta aggregation, or vascular damage, or uh, microglia activation. So which means the diet has been also impacting the brain and reduced the inflammation uh, for the mice. And how about their systematic uh, metabolism? As I mentioned, um, microbiome um, mitochondrial function is a main impact for APOE4 carriers. So we look into their blood um, um, metabolites, and you can see there are several uh, metabolites related to uh, TCA cycle has been uh, in increased in the E4 groups. You can see the control group already, E4 control group already have like trending um, lower uh, metabolites in this category uh, because they are young. So the, the, the difference is not significant. But once we give the diet just for four months, you can see that kind of restore uh, this uh, mitochondria related um, metabolites. And the second one, major one is a PPP, the uh, pentose phosphate pathway. And the, this pathway is related to um, glucose metabolism as well, but it's more related to oxidative, uh, prevent oxidative stress. And this also being increased in the um, APOE4 mice with the uh, inulin diet. So, so in, in, uh, the, in this study, we have three groups. We didn't include E4, uh, E3 inulin because we want to uh, see the inulin effect in the E4 first. But the next study, we indeed increase, uh, include uh, uh, E3 groups with inulin. So this is the metab uh, metabolome data. Uh, so this is a full change between inulin and control group. So the red one showing the higher, significant higher level between the inulin compared uh, to the control in the E3 group and the E4 group. So you can see that in the E4 groups, is uh, the changes is mainly related to mitochondrial function, TCA cycle, uh, pentose pathway, pathway, and bioassets. But the E3 groups is a very different response. They are most related to tryptophan and tyrosine metabolism. So again, saying that there's a nutrigenetic effects because the same diet, but different genotype have different response. And this finding actually very encouraging to us because when we look into humans, um, uh, before I jump into human data, so why tryptophan will be important? Because they also uh, have effects to uh, protect the brain function, like uh, reduce the DNA damage and uh, inhibit it. A beta plaque uh, formation. Um, so, um, and uh, reduce the activation of glial cell and astrocyte, which is related to inflammation. So, so E3 and E4 are respond well to inulin, but through different pathway. One is through TCA, one is through uh, tryptophan. And this is um, uh, in line with human data. When I was in Kentucky, we using the ADRC, Alzheimer's disease research brain bank. We took out the brain tissue from uh, donors, human donors and we stratify their APOE genotype, um, early versus late metabolite changes. And you can see that E3 and E4, E3 and E4 carriers will both develop, potentially develop Alzheimer's, but their pathways are different. E4 carriers are more related to Krebs cycle, TCA cycle, uh, mitochondrial function, while the E3 carriers also get Alzheimer's, but they have different pathways, oxidative DNA damage. So when we come back to this slide, 
DNA damage is really to potentially can be prohibited by uh, tryptophan. So it seems like the diet can work in both group, but going through different pathway. So that's a given us idea that we also need to consider nutrigenetic effects uh, using diet. So this is the APOE uh, genotype. And how about sex? Uh, we know um, APOE um, age and now come with a factor, female, as a higher risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. We don't know the uh, 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 root cause yet. Uh, the field is still trying to identify the, the mechanism. But this is a observation has been known for many years that female has higher risk for um, dementia. So we found that in the E4 male, um, female, you can see their alpha diversity of gut microbiome uh, is higher. It's very different from other groups. Other three groups like E3 male, E3, E4 male, or E3 control, they have very similar alpha diversity. Only the E4 female control have higher, which means they have different richness and evenness of their microbiome composition. But once we give the diet, you can see the alpha diversity being normalized um, for the E4 female. So, and also we look into the uh, uh, males, uh, they have more sh uh, uh, short fatty produced bacteria uh, for E4 female uh, males uh, compared to other groups, right? And then the E3 actually, whether with, 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 with or without the diet, doesn't really have too much difference. It's really in the E4 group and between the sex difference. So when we consider a diet, we not only need to consider the genotype, but also need to consider their gender or sex uh, in the animal model. So that helped me to think about future uh, clinical trial um, and, and consider about precision nutrition. Uh, I happen to know that HNRCA just recently got a major funding to look into precision nutrition. I'm very excited about for you all, and I hope we can share some idea and then uh, form collaboration in the future. And in Missouri, I identify several investigators I can work with. They are experts in nutrition, exercise physiology, insulin signaling, and cardiometabolic disorders. And we want to combine these factors to look into dementia. Uh, in addition to the seven Tesla MRI I mentioned, uh, we also have a swine uh, model uh, gene uh, genetics core here so we can make different genotypes of pigs. Uh, to help us more translatable from mouse to pig to humans, and to see how this can um, uh, address the concern about um, precision nutrition. So I'm coming to the end. So almost this is my overarching direction in the future is like now we have this advancement of technology. We can look into neuroimaging and multiomics so we can see more higher resolution of each individual of their medical, metabolic, physical data. And can we develop algorithms, algorithm, um, artificial intelligence, uh, like the AI, I just showed the very simple one, and can we develop a more complex one? And, and using even bioinformatics to for drug and nutrient discovery. Um, I know that the booth has looking into vitamin K, vitamin D uh, for um, mitigating Alzheimer's disease. And can we identify different genotype group will be most uh, beneficial from this uh, vitamins and other diets like my diet or mediterranean Mediterranean diet. And using that uh, model, can we prescribe precision um, um, intervention, uh, the drug and a diet uh, for that individual? So my hope is like we can do early identification, early intervention, and then do early prevention. Um, that's the future. <laughs> so coming to the summary. So um, um, I have been showing that treating Alzheimer's disease by targeting amyloid beta uh, based on the amyloid hypothesis has been failed repeatedly. So therapeutics alternative to a beta need to be identified and developed. So interventions that could restore brain vascular and metabolic function early at early stage will be critical to slow down brain aging and mitigate AD risk, especially for APOE4 carriers. And microbiome, yeah, targeting microbiome with diet could be uh, become a very promising and new interventional approach for mitigating uh, AD risk. So, and we have to consider pharmacogenetic and nutrigenetic effects because uh, different genotype and different gender sex will impacting the results. 
So finally, integration of imaging, multiomics, and AI could be a powerful tool for AD medication with a precision medicine approach, and I'm very hopeful for our future. So I really want to thank the wonderful students, talented students, in current, former and current students help out with this project, and my wonderful collaborator across many, many institutions, um, and uh, um, my uh, industrial partner and the funding agency uh, to make all this work possible. And most of all, thank you for your attention. And I hope we'll stay healthy and have um, healthy brain health. Yeah, so thank you all. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Dr. Lin, for your excellent presentation. Thank uh, you. Covered the spectrum of translational research. This is very exciting. Uh, so let's get, uh, move on to the Q&A. Okay. Uh, so Jose Ordovez asked, uh, the risk of uh, the slide showing the risk of conversion from normal to AD emphasizes APOE. However, the plot shows that the p value, p.22, uh, for E3 and E2, are these results representing E4 versus E2 and E3 or E4 versus the absence of E4? Uh, which slides are you? Uh, should I? Uh, sharing my slide again <laughs> so I can mm -hmm. have a yes please do yeah which one um so maybe I can <laughs> so maybe you can tell me the number um I don't have the number it was a significant p-value p022 do you remember that p o zero o two two zero point zero two two yeah e2 I don't think I have data showing e2 though all the data I have is E3, uh, E3 and E4. So I'm not clear about which slide. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. E3, uh, E2. Let's move on. So Michael Lisgarden asks, uh, aside from rapamycin mTOR inhibiting effects, have you considered that it's reducing gut and or blood levels of fungi as rapamycin's classical function is antifungal? This is Excellent question. So uh, there are several studies to start to looking into rapamycin effect on gut microbiome. And currently, um, to my understanding, the, the um, outcome is not conclusive. Some found positive, some found negative. But we already collect stool sample from those mice, and we are sequencing them right now um, at Missouri. So I think this is very uh, legit legitimate question, and I think that's the potential changes in microbiome composition. And I will. Hope to give you an answer soon in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Larissa Constantino asks, is there evidence on how dietary AGEs impact the risk of AD? Yes, yes. Um, yeah, so sugar, right? Um, if I in interpret this correctly, it's like how the sugar has been uh, converted into AGE and then that can cause toxin and inflammation in a brain. Actually, yes, uh, many, many studies and evidence showing that AGE play a big role in AD, um, especially we know that diabetes um, is a higher high risk factor for Alzheimer's disease right now. So it definitely play a role um, in it, yes. Great. Um... So this is a two-part question. I'll ask you one at a time. So Sarah mm -hmm. asks, uh, Dr. Lin, this was a fantastic seminar. First Thank question, you. do you have any ideas why in the rapamycin experiments, there was such large variance in response within each treatment group, even after accounting for sex of mice? So such large variance response to each. Yeah. So so that's why I'm saying that um, I need to go into mechanism study. So this study just um, first time give us, uh, I uh, try to give an observation what we can see with this drugs effect. So this is really purely observational study. So um, I, 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 I have to look into deeper how this drug um, impacting by through mTOR pathway, how does that modulating metabolism, how does that modulating vascular function? And I'm thinking about designing a mouse model with knockout of mTOR, um, not, uh, maybe just a knockdown there, mTOR1 and mTOR2 uh, to see the effects, uh, to um, know the mechanism much better. Um, how does the genotype and sex uh, respond differently to each uh, signaling pathway, right? 
Uh, Hopefully I answer uh, this question, sorry. Um, the second part of that question, uh, COVID-19 has long-term effects on glucose metabolism in the brain of certain patients. Will this mm -hmm. impact interpretation of AB patient studies? Yes. So we know um, there is more study coming into looking long COVID on um, brain fog and Alzheimer's disease and delirium. So there's a huge data start to show that um, COVID-19 impacting glucose metabolism also um, result in brain fog. And what are, what, what's the connection between these two? And there's a fear that for the next five to 10 years, we may see more people, younger people, develop Alzheimer's, early uh, onset of Alzheimer's because of COVID. That's the possibility. So um, people are really uh, keep an eye on the. I, I went into sem several seminars and workshop. People are concerning about this and talk about potential prevention about this happening um, with diet or drug uh, for long COVID patient. Yeah. And I saw there's a question about the glucose tolerance, right? About rapamycin. Oh, uh, is that what? Yeah, I can, yeah. I can read that just for our audience. Yeah, I can um, answer it. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, so, um, so yeah, so we know that long-term rapamycin will have uh, glucose intolerance when he, uh, so the short-term rapamycin will hit mTOR1 um, pathway and the long-term will become mTOR2, which is relative to uh, glucose intolerance. So we're hoping to have short-term, um, so we get kind of short-term rapamycin um, for humans, especially for humans. Um, and also we try to uh, start not from diabetic, patient. If someone already showing glucose intolerance, we are very cautious not giving them uh, rapamycin in, in, in the first place. Every drug has side effects. We know there's, you know, it's not always 100% beneficial. So we're very careful about that. Um, make sure the participants won't um, produce glucose intolerance effects. Um, and thank you for the question. That's very thoughtful. Yeah. Okay, next question. Uh, Alan Taylor asks, uh, or says, excellent talk. Uh, question is, the change in blood flow is not greater even in controls. Is this functionally significant? So change in blood flow was uh, even greater in controls. Uh, so changing, uh, which part, how late is the life can start about it? So you, uh, in controls, uh, sorry, yeah, I, I have a little bit <laughs> question about this question. Change in blood flow was not even greater in controls. Uh, what, oh, you mean the drop down where the, in the E4 mice, the, the reduction, um, so, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, no, I'm not sure. So yeah, if that's, if that's what it sounds like. So and then I can potentially answer the second question, how late in life can you start rapamycin? Um, so to my understanding, hopefully this uh, confidential conversation is like the rapamycin if start too late, right? If the person already dementia in very late stage, um, because the uh, metabolic system already impact dramatically. So at the time, if you get the drug, it's kind of imposed stress, even more stress in the system. So it may not work in a very, very late stage. So we are thinking about early still um, early dementia uh, when the, the, the disease is still convertible back to normal. That might be a, a better time window instead of waiting for a person to lay um, in a very severe stage. Um, yeah, and then, um, so about taurine, any? Uh, and the third question, sorry, I, I don't um, clear about that. But yeah, the second question is like, we may need to start sooner. So that's why we need to identify those who may have at risk. Yeah, yeah, that's all right. We can move on to another question. Okay. So uh, Jen Ford asks, do we have an idea of the prevalence of APOE4 in the US population? And would it not be prudent to suggest those genotypes start making dietary changes now? Yeah, so so this is a very good question. So so uh, people are saying, um, 
statistically wise, ApoE4 genotype actually has a lower population. That's from um, statistics. ApoE3 is the most populated, like 70, 70%, and APOE potentially 20% or less. But when I, um, when actually, but when we recruit participants, actually we found APOE4 carrier is much more than we expected. Uh, about 50% of people we recruited will have APOE genotype. So I don't know whether the status currently is correct or not. Maybe I can contact 23andMe and they may give me a more accurate um, um, APOE4 uh, uh, calculation. But, um, it's, but I will say that uh, genotype is uh, loading the gun. Uh, if you have this address, it's loading the gun, but lifestyle trigger, uh, trigger, uh, pull the trigger. So, so even though uh, we we know that not every APOE4 carriers get Alzheimer's disease, and looking to their uh, data, they are better health and better lifestyle. So I would say that yeah, if you the person have this um, genotype, they may need to start thinking about lifestyle changes early enough. Uh, whether they have family member have this disease, they may need to think about have a better diet um, um, or better sleep lifestyle, exercise, et cetera, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so this will be our last question. So Thomas okay. Chin asks, how does tryptophan metabolism affect the gut biology and can modifying tryptophan levels impact tau and beta amyloid formation? This is an excellent question. Um, so tryptophan, um, well, actually there's a, there are several groups already interested in tryptophan and how does that uh, modulating astrocyte inflammation and through a receptor co-ACHG1, sorry, I couldn't pronounce it correctly. And also that relates to bioassets as well. Um, and a lot of um, big data studies showing that bioasset changes impacting Alzheimer's disease dramatically. So I will uh, foresee that many study will coming up showing how tryptophan may impacting A beta and tau and AD pathology uh, in the future. Yeah, yes. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, so that concludes the question and answer. Um, so before closing, uh, I'd like to mention to our audience a related event, uh, the ASN uh, deep dive. And I have a slide I can share quickly. Um, it's a nutrition and neuro research, uh, neuroscience research event next week. Uh, and you can contact Tomas Beter uh, for more information on that. Uh, so thank you to our speaker today. And thanks to the audience for coming. Uh, the next HNRCA Monday seminar is in two weeks, and we'll see you then. Thank you. Thank you so much.